Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly fix of all things history. Coming up on this week's show. I sit down with Renaissance historian and writer, Dr Joanne Paul. And we continue our exploration of prehistoric skills and crafts with ancient artisans. But first up, let's go to the news. An 18th century Asian sword has been discovered by a coracle man in a river in Carmarthenshire. The Chris sword was dredged up from the river Towie, and it's a mystery how the Malaysian weapon ended up on a riverbed in Wales. And the 9,300 year old remains of a Mesolithic woman discovered in Spain are revealing their secrets. The individual, nicknamed Elba, was killed when she and her herd of Auroch cattle fell into a collapsed cave more than 7,000 years BCE. Next up, Dr Joanne Paul is an award-winning historian who has published her research on the Renaissance and early modern periods. We've interviewed her before on her work on Thomas More. This week we learn more about the nature of counsel and advice giving in Tudor and Stuart courts. Circa Regna Tonat, around the throne the thunder rolls. In what ways did counsel influence power in the Tudor and Stuart periods? Well, it sort of depends on which period within the Tudor period you're talking about, which monarch in particular, um, and which time in their life. Uh, someone like Henry VIII starts out really dependent upon his counselors, particularly Wolsey. As time goes on, it's less clear who he's listening to and how much he's listening to them, whether it's all coming from his own whims or whether he is listening to counsel. But I think the important thing is the expectation that they were listening to counsel. Uh, monarchs who didn't listen to counsel tended to go really badly for them, or if they were listening to the wrong sort of counsel. Counsel was really an important part of monarchy in the period, and to rule without it was considered to be illegitimate. And what parallels can be drawn with the modern world of political spin and intrigue? Quite a bit in a lot of ways. They were surprisingly aware of things like the gaze of, of the spectators, the citizens around them, the subjects around them. Um, and there were attempts to use propaganda to get people on board or to convince people of things, especially as the period goes on, you get um, more print propaganda, more things coming from the crown. I guess the important difference, however, is the place of council. Um, as I said, during the Tudor period, there was an understanding that council was essential. It, it, it helped to legitimize rule. That's almost less the case now, and councillors are often referred to as the people in the dark, the people that you you don't want being sort of sharing the spotlight with a politician. I suppose the only counsel that's supposed to matter at this point is coming from the people themselves, not the ministers and advisors. And so there's often an attempt to downplay the role that they have. In what ways was Shakespeare a political thinker? Well, I think Shakespeare was um, importantly clued in to what was happening politically at his time. I think the important thing to remember is that in the period, there wasn't really the same distinction we have now between fiction or theater and political writing. Um, there wasn't, it's, uh, political writing really wasn't its own genre. So someone like Shakespeare, uh, who's writing dramas, um, was in many ways a political commentator of his own time, and that's a political thinker. In what ways does the character of Polonius from Hamlet define and reflect Elizabethan counsel? So Polonius, I think, is meant to be uh, a critique of political counsel in the Elizabethan period. Uh, I think he's meant to be a bad, good counselor and a good, bad counselor. And what I mean by that is that he's not very good at being morally good. Um, he, he's the, the, the best counselor in terms of being a, a philosopher or a humanist, he's really bad and sort of bumbling about that. But he is actually quite good at being a sort of Machiavellian counselor. So he's good at being a, a morally bad counselor. He, he does a lot of scheming. It doesn't work out for him hiding behind an heiress, but he does a lot of scheming and spying. And so he's, he's actually sort of the worst of both worlds. And I think Shakespeare was attempting to critique the way that counsel was being thought about in his own period through Polonius.
Next up in viral history, Hayley Considine once again travels back in time to learn more about the rich and varied skills and crafts of our ancestors in ancient artisans. Welcome back everybody to the Ancient Technology Centre in Cranbourne and I'm joined by Andy who is going to be talking to us about these wonderful birds and their uses. So over to you Andy. I was originally trained using modern falconry techniques where you use a, a system called weight control where you reduce the bird's weight, take its food away and when the bird's hungry enough it'll do what you want. Um, I was always taught that birds don't bond with you, they don't want to be with you, they don't love you, you should never think that they do, they're only controlled through food and they're a tool. Then we bought a historical manuscript with our passion for history and we found that historically they did exactly the opposite. So instead of taking the food away from the bird, um, you're giving the bird as much food as it could possibly eat. You keep them on your glove, you, walk, you carry them around with you 24-7, you keep them in the banqueting hall, you keep them in the bedchamber, you even take them to church with you. Eventually the bird learns when he's on your glove you don't harm him, you protect him from external stimuli and also you give them as much food as you can possibly eat. That way, the birds can be flown in a very, very high condition without having to reduce their weight to make them fly. Um, you wouldn't really want to starve an athlete and expect him to perform in the Olympics. And it was the same with history. Um, people in history wanted them to catch large geese, heron, crane. A hungry bird that's not feeling fit and strong would never even think of taking those. They would go for a smaller target, which would look bad on the king or the falconer. So they, they used these techniques that were mainly came from the Muslim countries and were learnt during the crusading period and brought back during the crusades to Britain and used ever since. So obviously you're dressed as somebody that's pre-Tudor. Can you tell us about uh, the relationship between the bird and the age that you are dressed at? Um, well, yes, basically I'm dressed as in sort of Beaker period, um, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age period. Um, <clears throat> now, officially falconry started in the Roman period, according to the history books. Um, we've been on a crusade for the last 12 years to find research to prove otherwise um, and we think we found enough evidence to prove without a doubt that falconry was happening long before that in the UK. Um, the problem is, is the lack of equipment, it rots in the ground so you don't really get to find any from that period but there's been lots of grey finds of hawks, skulls and various equipment. Um, one of them was a wrist guard um, in a beaker burial and it had scratch marks on it and it was dismissed as not being falconry related because people wear gloves. But still in the Middle East to this day, they still wear cuffs. Um, also, there was a bone toggle found that matches exactly what the Mongolian tribes people still use today to tether eagles to their belts. So this wrist guard, the toggle, and the bird's skull in the grave, it seemed, for us, is enough evidence to suggest that this was a, an, an beaker period falconer that was buried with his bird. So these were hunters then? Falcons, um, especially in the later period, were used for political purposes. They weren't really the best hunters to bring in food for the table. It was more of a sport and an art to show off your wealth and power. Um, whereas the goshawks and the occipitors, the sparrowhawk and the goshawk, they were used for hunting predominantly. Now this bird was a goshawk skull found in this beaker burial. So it, it stands to reason that he was using that bird to hunt um, and, and bring in food for the table. And because they, we came from the, they came from the Middle East at that time and brought farming with them, did they leave falconry behind that they were already practising out in the Middle East at that time and forget it to come to England? It doesn't seem likely. Well, great, I think I've made a friend here. <laughs> Thank well, you so is, much. This is Vercingetorix. He's named after the famous Gallic resistance leader. Oh, wow, a so fighter. We thought we'd give him a good name to try and give him lots of confidence. Oh, well, it's lovely to meet you. And Thank you very you much. As well. Nice to speak to you. Thank you very much for joining us, guys, and we'll speak to you soon. Bye bye. Next up, it's on this day. Today in 1975, Japanese climber Junko Tabai became the first woman to reach the summit of the world's highest peak, Mount Everest in Nepal. Well, that's about it from us for this week. Feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and tune in next week. 
And remember, what's past is prologue. See you in seven days. We've interviewed a bit. And, uh, oh. <laughs> Welcome back to the Ancient Technology Centre. And in Sorry, go again. Ancient Technology Centre. Okay. So can you tell us the difference between modern falconry, the techni techniques, uh, let me do that again. So can you tell us about the difference in techniques used between, oh gosh. Oh yeah.